So what I love is that this is called Dollars and Cents, because in 2008 um, or 2007, I approached publishers with an idea for a book called Dollars and Saints, S-A-I-N-T-S. Um, I'd interviewed the Dalai Lama and Rabbi Harold Kushner and a bunch of other like spiritual teachers from Eastern traditions about what they had to teach about money and suffering because it's such a like central focus in our culture. And the publishers are like, I don't want a book of interviews, you write a book. So anyway, I ended up writing a book, but I still always love that play on words. So it's kind of fun. This is called Dollars and Cents. As Tracy said, like I'm in the sustainable investing, like helping people make a difference in the world with their own investments. I'm not a venture capitalist, I'm not an investment banker. So I called up all my friends who are venture capitalists and private equity guys and funds that we invest in to get my content to help you guys uh, think about your companies. First, I was asked to define what a social enterprise is. I think everybody here probably knows their own definition of it. But essentially, the, the key things are that it applies commercial strategies. So for profit, there needs to be a market for what it's doing eventually to maximize improvements in financial, social, and environmental well-being. So what this slide is meant to kind of show you is that while there's about $410 billion given to charity each year, there's a $79 trillion investment market. So for every dollar of grant money out there, there's about $200 of investment capital. Now, that doesn't mean we can solve the world's problems with investment capital. There are things that only charitable money can do, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It de-risks a lot of these things that commercial investors will ultimately want to invest in, but are not ready to, to take the super early stage technology risk where you know, the chance of failure might be equal to or higher than the chance of success. So how do both charitable and, and commercial investors think about this? Um, at least through our worldview, there's kind of an impact only view. There's an impact first view and a financial first view. I agree with what Tracy said. I think you can have tremendous impact with great financial returns. Our single best investment ever at Abacus is uh, an investment that helped 11 million people in India and Latin America get themselves out of poverty and made our clients 27% compounded annual rates of return over a decade. I, I believe in like Econ 101. If you make the most difference in people's lives, you'll get an outsized return on your capital. So impact only, basically, you know, generally capital isn't returned. It's usually grants as opposed to loans or equity investments. What's the motivation of the funder there? It's kind of like, what does it cost me to get a unit of outcome? For me to make a certain amount of difference in the beneficiary's life, if I can do 50 bucks with this nonprofit and 1,000 bucks with that nonprofit for the same unit of positive impact, I'm going to go with 50 bucks. So that's kind of the, the ROI that one's looking for with impact only. What are the metrics? They're kind of the same across all three of these. I mean, we think of it as sustainable development goals, the UN's 17 SDGs, as they're known for short. And then at a more kind of granular level, what are called iris metrics, which is like, you know, how many individuals are you increasing food security for, as one example. And the financial metric is, is the nonprofit generally uh, using these funds efficiently or not? So in impact first, this might be a program-related investment, a PRI, which is something where a charity is allowed to make an investment, and usually for a concessionary return or just to get their capital back. But the, the onus is on them to essentially prove or assert that a commercial investor wouldn't do this thing. They, they wouldn't make this investment, and therefore, it can be a PRI and it can satisfy the foundation's requirement to give away 5% of its principal per year. So these could be convertible debt, they could be a variable payment obligation, it could be, it's almost always debt of some kind where they're expecting the principal back. The motivation is that they will recycle the money and be able to use it again, that makes it more sustainable, and they're looking for a high probability of breaking even on their grant. The financial metric is what's the net cash flow of the enterprise? How will they repay us without having to wait for, let's say, an exit or a strategic acquisition? And then lastly is the one I'm most familiar with. We call it financial first here. I don't know, at, at Abacus and Align, we look for financial and impact side by side. So this is like more traditional debt, equity. We're looking at what is the kind of margin per outcome? What's the um, accretion per individual that's being benefited? Uh, from the investment. And these metrics are going to be much more financial ones, internal rate of return, the return on our investment, um, and you know, the, the cash flow, essentially. 
So I won't read this entire slide to you. I hate slides with this much text on them, but I wanted it to look like this so that when you get the PDF, you can read them. But in general terms, the top two are gifts and grants. So you know, not expecting the money back, essentially. The middle three are loans where the money is being expected back, but no like commercial rate of return on the money. Convertible debt, the second to the bottom one, is usually what's given in seed stage and pre-seed types of commercial investors. So I'm going to give you some names of angel investment groups and early stage VCs that would come in with convertible debt, um, you know, where essentially they're, you are having to value the company pre-money. You are giving them warrants that they can convert to equity when you do your Series A or whatever your first price round of financing is. And then equity is generally a little later stage, and that's where you're looking at an exit strategy. You're looking usually to make you know, four to 10 times on your money because 50 to 80% of these are gonna fail and become zero. So you need the four to 10 times on the few that succeed in order for your fund to make its 15 to 20% IRR. So here's the SDGs if you haven't seen them. I would definitely, when you're doing a pitch deck uh, or something, I would focus on these. I think they're becoming more and more universally referred to by a lot of impact investors. And I wanted to just say that, you know, your currency, the main currency you have in the early stage is your deck, is what you're taking out to investors. So don't minimize it. Don't assume that because you've got the best products in sliced bread that every investor is going to get it. Hire a designer, um, minimize text. Don't follow my example on the last slide. Less is more. 10 to 15 slides is enough. It's a teaser. You just want enough interest that they you know, want to learn more about the business. And then leverage your networks like crazy. So the more you can kind of uh, get two or three or four introductions to the same person from people on LinkedIn or however you know them, the better. Warm intros are way, way better than cold calls. Um, but I would definitely make SDGs part of your deck. So which SDGs are you touching? And which iris metrics are you going to use to measure your impact? Iris is an absurdly detailed and, and, and in-depth database. I wasn't going to try and give you a screenshot of just how granular it is. But I did want to show you how many other groups, and this is only probably a quarter of the ones on their website, that are adopting iris metrics as part of their way of measuring impact. Again, iris and SDGs, I think, are becoming kind of two of the universally accepted ways of measuring. This could be a really helpful uh, resource to a lot of you. It's a relatively new thing. It's still in beta. It's called the Impact Terms Project. And what this is, is it, um, it puts together examples of deal term sheets. And it also has a lot of legal language in it about kind of how do you protect mission? How do you make sure that the investors that come in aren't going to demand that you stray from your mission? Um, how do you bake that in legally? What do you do with a term sheet that's for a benefit corp as opposed to a normal C corp or for-profit uh, organization? So if you go to impactterms.org, you'll see there's about seven different kind of sections in there where they give you specific language you can use in term sheets and as you're approaching investors. It's not a database of potential funds or investors. It's really more about deal structure, legal language, uh, impact measurement, baking that into your term sheets, et cetera. I spoke to a couple of VCs, as I mentioned, and this was one of their advice, and I thought all of this stuff was really valuable. So if you're part of an incubator, make sure that you're leveraging its connection to customers. The main thing a funder wants to know is that their capital is kind of the last thing you need. You've got everything else in place, and you need that nudge of some capital to basically get the business into a, into a momentum kind of stage. You don't have to be profitable, but um, that you're going to be growing revenues. Financials are really, really important. If you aren't really good at preparing and maintaining financials, get someone on the team who is. If you don't have strong operational controls, almost every sophisticated investor will pass. As much as you can, explore loans and grants. There's so much out there from the SBA, from foundations trying to encourage women-owned or minority-owned businesses. The more of that you get, the more that the commercial investor's capital is being leveraged with grants or government money, the better. And then explore all the different types of venture capitals. There's even profit sharing models. This one I put up there, novelgp.com. 
I think they only fund businesses in the Midwest, so I don't know that it'll help anyone here. But take a look at the model, because it's basically just a, a cash flow sharing model, and they're not looking for an exit. They're looking for ongoing durable cash flow where you kind of retain the company for years or decades, and they get their money back through income. This, again, I'd, I'll leave it more for the handout for you guys, but it's, it's a diff essentially the difference between debt and equity and, and what people are looking for. I've already kind of covered some of that, um, but you know, tells you some of the tax treatment for the investor, uh, the company tax implications, et cetera, et cetera. So this might be the most valuable slide uh, that I'm giving you, and, and the reason I'm giving it to you is that you know, while Tracy and Z and Taj asked uh, me and, and Maggie and Tara to come up here and speak today, we're not really funders of your kinds of businesses, right? So we, we do different things and are in different kinds of organizations, but in my organization, we invest our clients' money into impact funds like these that in turn invest in businesses like yours. So I wanted to break down these four kind of stages of investment and who some of the Southern California focused funds are. So pre-seed, this is generally pre-revenue. It's generally, you know, where you kind of, you have to have a great team in place and you have to have demonstrated that there's a, a need, there's an opportunity in the market for what you're going to provide and that you're the right people to provide it. And if you can prove those two things, then these kinds of groups, um, you know, members of Tonic, members of Social Venture Network, Tech Coast Angels, and then these four funds, Crowdfunder, Mucker Cap. Crowdfunder doesn't mean generally like Kickstarter. It's an actual venture company called Crowdfunder. Mucker Capital, Crosscut Ventures, and Fika Ventures are all Southern California focused and will all, a couple of them have incubators in-house. They will all look at pre-seed investments if it's the right team and if there's a demonstrable market opportunity. Seed is two to four million generally. I've listed a number of commercial-oriented venture companies that would be in this range. So this is where you have to have revenues already. The kind of demand has been established by the market, and you just need the capital to grow, to grow staff or grow a product line, et cetera. Series A is way down the line. Now you've, you know, you've really proved you've got a lot of traction. You have to expand production a lot or expand geography a lot. I've given you a list. Most of these are national players, but they all have invested in Southern California energy-focused companies. And then late stage, this is, you know, now you're one of the darlings of clean tech, and firms like TPG and Generation will look at you. And these would be the folks I'd be going to if I were in your shoes. Just to differentiate what we do, we're really on the client side of the table, not the company side of the table. We're focusing on all of these different areas of a client's life. And you can see impact at the top left we're really, our mission is to expand what's possible with money. And so that means we're talking to a client about what are your values, what SDGs really matter to you, what we don't use that language usually, but what, what kind of social and environmental change do you want to see in the world? How can we use your capital, your influence, your time to help that impact happen while you reach your financial goals as well? So for the handful of you that are one day going to get acquired by a giant company or go public, you can call me up then and I'll help you figure out how to balance all these things out. GSBI is an incubator up at Santa Clara University. They have an awesome white paper and an awesome investment ready slide deck that have examples of what your financials should look like, examples of what good governance looks like. It's just, it's tremendous. And they, these things they use in the, their months long course to prepare entrepreneurs for investment. But um, as I went through these things, I'm like, OK, in 15 minutes, there's no way I can show these guys screenshots of all the valuable stuff in here. So I'm just linking to them. And I would definitely spend some time with both of these. And that's me. You're welcome to reach out to me again. I, I can't fund you directly, but if you're really ready for investment and you want me to tell you which of those funds on that prior slide I think might be best for your particular business, I'm happy to try and help. Thank you. <laughs>